Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. It's Thursday, March 17th. This is Real Talks. Jesperson, Hoyles, and Hicks with you. Before we get the show started, I want to remind you that this show is presented by our friends at Bitcoin. Well, we've got a St. Patrick's Day edition of the show, kind of a soft St. Patrick's Day around here. We'll ease into it. But I want to give a shout out to Bitcoin. Well, before we start going here, Benny's the guy that I talk to every time I go there. I want to give you a name. So when you reach out there, you're not calling in. You're being like, I heard about you guys on Real Talk. And what's the you just call and you go, yeah, put me through to Benny. Yeah, I need to talk to Benny. Benny is the frontline guy that takes all the questions you have about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Bitcoin wallets, the blockchain and everything else. You could book your consultation today with our title sponsors, Bitcoin Well, by checking about online. Bitcoinwell.com slash consultation or give him a call at 1 888 711 3866. You're looking for Benny. You'll find him under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. That's Ayla Brook. You hear every time we open the show. What a pleasure to see them on stage last night at uh, the Starlight Room. That's uh, a pretty sexy venue that we have uh, nice. in Edmonton, of course. You know Starlight Room. Of course. I've still got some like... Incredible venue. I've, I've still got drumming underneath me. Is this? Do, do I get to keep the drumming the whole show? I'll keep it. You don't hear it? I'm hearing it. Yeah, we're getting all, Yeah, we're getting it. Hoyles, nice work wearing the green today. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. And same to you, dear. Oh, thank you, oh, thank you lass. <laughs> yeah, I think I ain't put your <laughs> It's okay. okay. Every time I get into accents, it always sort of like, it, 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 it all, every accent I'm doing, no matter from where on planet Earth, it always winds up as the same accent from one specific region of planet Earth. So I've given up on accents for the most part. Uh, but, but, I, but I applaud you. You've got kind of the... Uh, you, you've got like the uh, the camo or the the military. You've got the Zelen- You're wearing the Zelensky green today. I am. Yeah, That's bit, right. bit, bit, bit of a shout that. out. I didn't even think of that. Bit of a shout out to Vladimir Zelensky. Did you see the criticism he had yesterday from I, I don't remember somebody oh, somebody geez. with a big Twitter follow somebody with like a million Twitter followers. I can't remember the name, but somebody was like, you know, basically would be nice if Zelensky would wear a suit every once in Are a while. Are you kidding me? <laughs> he's talking to heads of state. He's addressing Parliament and senators, and and he's addressing the House of Representatives and the least he could do is put on a suit and of course everybody i wish i could remember the name it would be a better story if i could we didn't plan on talking about this uh but we're sitting there going like he's he's literally surviving assassination attempts every single day uh he's he's the president of a country under siege the russians are attacking them on all fronts or virtually and uh and here he is getting criticized for not wearing a suit to work but uh but nice work on the saint patrick's day colors i'm not trying to put you in a bad mood right away <laughs> well too late for that <laughs> Johnny Hicks, you got that's that's sort of like a it's green, I guess, in a way. So I had an idea today to wear like this with a vest and like a like a like a full leprechaun. No, like one of those patty hats you wear to uh, like golfing and stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, kind of the, and I was like, I, I know that someone's just gonna say I'm stereotyping the Irish culture, so I backed out, and this is what I got. Nobody cares about that, though. Don't worry about it, right? <laughs> I mean, the the real talk is is that cultural cultural appropriation is on a sliding scale of how seriously people take it. Like today, it's actually it's totally 100 percent true. That's 100 percent true, and it just has everything to do with whiteness, and that's okay. And now people are going to say the woke left wing tinfoil hat conspiracy hour, <laughs> Jesperson's conspiracy hour, is now touching on cultural appropriation in the first two minutes. I'm just having fun with it, but uh, but you can say today, you can walk into a bar and you can order a Guinness, and everyone will look at you and you'll say, "Today we are all Irish," right? Uh, but in other circumstances, on other days, you don't get to claim the same affiliation with other cultures or nationalities. So have some fun with it today, I say. Do you have big St. Patty's Day plans? Dude, we're still in a pandemic. Yeah. I am not going anywhere. That doesn't I'm have anything to do with home. anything. Yeah, so good. So what's your plan? Put, put some green food coloring in your milk. Do whatever. You have any plans? Are you going to get enthusiastic about it in any way? Nope. No. Hicks, you getting enthusiastic in any way? Yeah, I'm gonna be tired tomorrow. I think. <laughs> oh, that boy! I'd be playing a little bit guilty tomorrow. I'll text you tonight. Yeah, I'd be curious to know what is that like a warning? If if we, if we get a text from you at, at one in the morning, we know that we're in trouble the next day, right? Yeah, I'd be curious to know if people. It, it's kind of that. It's it's kind of crossover, isn't it, Hoyles? Because you talk about the pandemic. Undeniably, we are still in a pandemic. Everybody knows that, or everybody's pretty sure about that. Um, I'm still see- seeing a, a ton of people, though, though these, you know, these mask mandates aren't necessarily still in place, but I'm, I'm seeing a bunch of people still wearing masks, but I'd be curious to see, this is kind of the first 
St. Patrick's Day in a few, right? The last last yeah, couple. Two. I mean, the, if you think two years ago today, March seventeenth, two years ago, it was pretty much day one. Mm-hmm. Like two years ago today was the first day that I did my terrestrial radio show from my house. It was St. Patrick's oh, Day. And okay. I remember that because I did the show. And then as soon as I was done, I took off my headphones and I went to my buddy's garage and we started crushing drinks and talking <laughs> and, and, and started asking each other how long we thought this thing was going to last. And at that point, we were figuring between a few weeks to a couple of months. Yeah. And of course, now here we are two years later. So, so uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to know if, if people are going to be back, like sort of hitting their favorite Irish bar today or if it's going to be another edition of a, of a pretty slowed down St. Paddy's Day. Two years Years ago, bar owners said that was their last kick at the can for a while. So they, they mm. rang up some some decent revenues, rang up a big, big tab. People were ringing up big bar tabs two years ago. Today, yeah. And then that was pretty much when everything shut down. Yeah. I mean, you want to be safe. But at the same time, I think I think those venues, I want them to to get back to making some dough. Right. Yeah. So I hope everyone just, you know. Kind of stay safe, but spend some money this St. Patty's Day as safely as you can so yeah. those restaurants and businesses can blossom again, right? Yeah. I just saw a cheap shot on Bitcoin in the in the live chat. I want to touch on that, even though it's going to take us off track and it's going to put us behind no, James. Do says, it. James says, Bitcoin, the choice of oligarchs everywhere. Oh. And uh, it, it's kind of funny because a lot of people are going, yeah, well, Bitcoin is how all these rich people are hiding their money. And Bitcoin is what organized crime is using because it can't be traced. And I'm trying to think... What was that other thing? What was that other thing that organized crime? Right, cash. You're talking about cash that organized crime has used for years and years and years. That's what you mean, right? So Bitcoin's kind of just like cash in the sense that people can't track it and it can be used for nefarious purposes, but it's not inherently bad. James, you know what's also awesome about Bitcoin is that in El Salvador, where they just made it legal currency a few months ago, GDP in El Salvador is up 12% this year just because of that. Isn't that great? As a matter of fact, all the lefties that crack on Bitcoin all the time, you guys should honestly really take some time to do a deep dive into what it's doing to lift people out of poverty and make banking and savings account and fund transfers accessible to people that don't have money. So oligarchs use Bitcoin and so do super, super duper poor people in developing nations. And that's the thing about it is that it's globally applicable. We've got a Bitcoin conversation coming up on the show in a few weeks. And Adam O'Brien, the CEO of Bitcoin, well saying to me he's going save all of the most scathing remarks about cryptocurrency save the biggest cracks at it and those are the ones that he wants to take on i mean i think it's also worth noting that yeah have your comments in the live chat but then head on over to the website because we actually have a question of the week about bitcoin well love it Hoyles. about crypto yeah. and nfts so take that ire take it and put it into our question we of want the it week. on the record yes absolutely good point and uh, nfts is another fascinating one cryptocurrency and nfts not necessarily the same thing but they're definitely part of this digital revolution which is why our team at y station put them together in the question of the week ryan you click on connect and then you go and you take our question of the week and we're hoping to have about a thousand of you do it this week which would be great speaking of y station before we get to our curriculum roundtable today, and we've got a whole bunch of stories to keep an eye on. Hoyles is, is obviously monitoring the news as it develops today, too. I was also lucky enough and honored to attend last night the University of Alberta Alumni Awards, and we wanted to give a special shout out to our good friend, the chief strategist at Y Station, Chris Henderson, who was honored last night with an Alumni Horizon Award. These are, these are the awards that the Alumni Association hands out when they go, uh, we know that you're not necessarily, uh, you, know, you don't have like the white hair yet. Uh, you're still able to walk without a cane. You're not in the advanced stage of life. You know, these folks that get honored by Alumni Association, they have like three doctorates and, and they've been honored by four different sovereign nations and they've advised three prime ministers. Chris isn't quite there yet. But the Alumni Horizon Award says, at this point in your career, you are killing it. And congratulations to Chris and everybody else uh, that was honored and recognized last night as part of the University of Alberta's uh, Alumni Awards. A really special evening, and we were proud to be there on behalf of Real Talk, and we're really proud of that partnership with Y Station. We'll talk curriculum coming up in just a second. I got an email literally half an hour ago from our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, and they said, Jesperson, make sure you let everybody know, first of all, Happy St. Patrick's Day. That from Michelle and Mark and Michael. They own all these locations they said make sure that you let everybody know that our blizzard for the month is the mint brownie blizzard they said that it's perfect for saint patrick's day if you're looking for something green 
Hoyles, a mint brownie blizzard. Nope, can't do mint. She, can't do mint. Oh, period. That's a non-starter. Yeah, chocolate and mint do not belong together. That's my favorite <laughs> choc- That's my favorite ice cream flavor of all time is spearmint chip. Mint chocolate. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you, Hoyles? What's wrong with you? you know what? I used to think that we could amicably disagree, but you I'm know? not so sure anymore. Back to the Dairy Queen mansion. You know what this is great actually is because you and I can go to ice cream parties together. I know you're not gonna touch mine. Well, that's great. Yeah, we can love it. Oh, yeah, yeah. The mint brownie blizzard is perfect for St. Patrick's Day. You want to take the kids, it's brownie pieces, choco chunks, and cool mint all together with the world famous Dairy Queen soft serve. It is simultaneously rich and refreshing. The result a flavor combination that tastes like early spring. I want to be the writer that comes up with that. You can find the Mint Brownie Blizzard at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road in Sherwood Park. You let them know when you show up at those Dairy Queens that you're there because you're a big fan of real talk. Our friends at Kubi Energy want it to be all over your radar. Positive reflections coming up on Monday. Whatever filled your bucket, whatever whatever made your day, the random act of kindness, the thing your kids said to you that transformed your afternoon, send it to us to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Kubi Energy is providing solar energy solutions to power your life if you go to kubienergy.ca check out their blog check this out they've got all kinds of links to things like the clean energy improvement program and the canada greener homes grant this is where you can tap into funding to get your house on that green energy path at kubienergy.ca plus if you're headed out of town if you're on your way to somewhere hot you have earned it you have paid your dues you have waited you've saved your pennies and it's time to travel why not go to jetsetparking.com today and book your airport parking if you're flying out of edmonton international airport the promo code real talk at jetsetparking.com is going to get you seven dollar a day parking at eia plus they've got a complimentary shuttle the promo code real talk you can book your spot today for travel through to the end of 2022 at jetsetparking.com well, you know, one of our challenges on this show is to stay on top of the stories that are making news, to stay on top of the stories that, that mean something, the stories that are truly important to you. And that means that, that every once in a while, if we're focusing on, for example, energy economies, or if we're focusing on the war in Ukraine, or if we're focusing on COVID-19, or, or disruptions like protests and demonstrations and occupations, other stories can fly under our radar. It doesn't mean that they're not still big stories. Like, when's the last time we talked about coal mining in the Canadian Rockies, right? When's the last time we talked about Alberta's curriculum overhaul? We figured it was time to circle back. And these three individuals that we're about to check in with, I'll tell you, they haven't taken a day off. We're about to talk to three of the foremost experts across the country when it comes to curriculum development, most especially here in Alberta. An announcement just a couple of days ago that the Alberta government will be delaying its new math and English curriculums for grades four to six until next year. But it's moving ahead with this updated curriculum for kids in K to three, kindergarten to grade three. The Alberta Teachers Association has conducted its own poll with its members And it's not exactly flattering. It shows that about 5% of teachers believe that the new K-6 curriculum will be positive for students. 5%. Let's get into the expert commentary here. Dr. Carla Peck, you've heard her on the show before. She's on the steering committee for the Alberta Curriculum Analysis, a professor of social studies education in the faculty of ed at the University of Alberta. Uh, Dr. Dwayne Donald is an associate professor in the faculty of ed at the University of Alberta. His work focuses on ways in which indigenous philosophies can expand and enhance the learning experience. Dr. Donald is a descendant of the Beaver Hills people of the Pappas Chase Cree. And Dr. Angela Grace has everybody talking after her call into a fledgling radio show this weekend she's a registered psychologist a university instructor and a former elementary school teacher she's the lead assessment psychologist at prevail psychology in calgary alberta to the three of you welcome to real talk thanks for making time for us dr grace i should also probably mention you're the author of an opinion editorial that ran in post media papers just a couple of days ago it's time to ditch alberta's frankenstein draft curriculum what's so bad about it from where you're standing well i'm just gonna say the typo in that title says everything (laughs) (laughs) 
I tried to just sort of blow past it. You may have noticed. Well, no, like this is, I, I laughed hysterically when I saw that because I'm like, that is exactly what has happened is this curriculum, this curriculum came out last year. There was this huge outcry and it's literally been this cut and paste wording change over the last year that it, it's just become the shooting target. And it's just become so preposterous. And as Dr. Carla Peck said in her um, Alberta Views article, it's completely absurd. And so we can't, we just simply can't go forward with this. Um, and then to have the premier tell me himself that he does not accept the premise of my question of why he is rolling through a curriculum that so many loving teachers, parents, and professionals, and marginalized groups oppose. And I don't even want to say marginalized groups. Like, it's, you know, Dwayne is here, our First Nation Métis Inuit. If, it is so important that we tell our stories properly and have them told, told in the right way that we simply can't have this curriculum go through. Um, the other thing that I want to say is what's frightening to me is last last May, I came out with, well, last April, I came out with a report about the damage that this draft curriculum, this draft PE and wellness curriculum will cause. And that is the only curriculum that they are putting through from K till six this September. And from my perspective as a teacher and a mental health professional, it is one of the most harmful parts of the curriculum. And yet literally all Adriana Lagrange has done is made a couple wording changes and stuck in the word body image and is promoting to Alberta that, you know, they've got this, they've, they've made the changes and it's going to be great. It's not, it is, it is horrific. I mean, Dr. Donald, we're hearing words from an expert here, like preposterous and horrific describing a new curriculum. Do you concur? I mean, do you feel the same way? And if so, why? I, I definitely concur with what my colleagues have, have said and written uh, and supported teachers and parents and trying to understand, you know, what's at stake with this, with these proposals. Um, you know, myself, I guess what I want to say, Ryan, is that anybody who studied curriculum in any detail knows that it's not very hard to list off a bunch of topics that you think, you know, should be studied, whatever the subject area. That's easy. Anybody could do that. Real work is trying to figure out what's the vision, what are the philosophies, what's the spirit and intent, what are the notions of you know knowledge and knowing that undergird what, that support what's being proposed, and that that doesn't exist in these proposals. Here's here's what I want to say. I'll cut to the chase. My view is is that ever since Christopher Columbus did what he did, what we've seen over you know several centuries, of course, is the imposition of behavioral norms cultural-based behavior norms about how a successful human being uh, conducts his or herself. And schools have become places where these norms have been um, you know, played out over the, over the decades. It's clear to me that we need, a, we need a new trajectory. We need a new understanding of what it means to live well, what it means to be a human being living here in Alberta and Canada. And this, these proposals, this government, refuses to take seriously the wisdom from Indigenous people. I'll use treaties as an example if people want a practical example. We have this beautiful inheritance of how we can live together that you know has been a massive curricular omission across the country um, as a guide for how we can understand ourselves, not just in a human-to-human -human relationship, but in relation to all the life around us. And uh, that's the kind of understanding that I think uh, young people in Alberta are, are kind of urgently in need of, is how can we live differently? Um, how can we not just worship the market with everything we do? How can we change our relationship to um, the things that give us life? And there's none of that leadership here at all. There's none of that vision. And if you think about curriculum as a, you know, upwards of a 20, 25 year commitment, you know, once it rolled out, then you know, there's no kind of thought at all about what this is going to mean for us in the decades to come. It's it's a back to the basics approach that, you know, is, is going to do a lot of damage. I've never I've, I've never I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, how, how do we not worship the market? But I love how you put it. It just cuts right to the chase. 
And as soon as you said it, Dr. Donald, this is probably your intent. It got me thinking, okay, so what's our, what's sort of our impetus or what's our, like, what's the assignment for someone that's designing curriculum? And maybe Dr. Peck, maybe you pick up on this. Uh, you know, when you say what should curriculum accomplish and people might say, well, you know, it's, you're supposed to educate people or people, but what do we say? We want to, we want to prepare students for success. Like schools will have the, the slogan on the wall and often it's like preparing students for success. And I guess, you know, has, has the way that we define or gauge success changed or evolved? Or maybe the problem is it's not changed or not evolved. I, I mean, you know, you're the author of, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Grace pointing this out. Back in January, you wrote a piece for Alberta Views. People should check it out. We're proud to subscribe to Alberta Views here at albertaviews.ca. The absurd UCP curriculum. You can see it. I've got it on my screen right now. The, the piece that you wrote. What, 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 I'm from your vantage point, what was so absurd about it? And has anything changed in the three months since you wrote this? Uh, the short answer would is no. Nothing's changed at all. Um, Ryan, there's so much that is absurd about this curriculum that to try to fit into the word limit of an Alberta Views article was <laughs> maybe the most challenging piece of writing I've had to do in my career. Okay. Um, from the outset of the curriculum design process uh, under this government, everything has been done, in my view, incorrectly. They tore up the uh, memorandum of understanding that they had with the ATA that ensured that teachers would be involved in the process from day one, not just in writing the actual curriculum documents, but in conceiving what is it that we want, as, as Duane has talked about, what is it that we want and believe uh, should be the vision for uh, students uh, who will graduate uh, at the end of their uh, at the end of their school programs, you know, what kind of person do we want them to be? And what we see in this curriculum uh, that has been proposed by this government is an incredibly narrow view of what success looks like and what kind of graduate they are looking for. There is no opportunity in this curriculum for creative endeavor endeavors. There's no opportunity in this curriculum for critical thinking. Uh, it's long lists of facts. I love what Dwayne said, that anybody can write a long list of facts. You just have to go to Wikipedia. They've actually done it for you. Um, and they haven't always been fact-checked, which as we've seen in this curriculum, all kinds of errors, like the classic find, locate gravity on a globe. I mean, the fact that that even was released to the public should be a uh, eternal shame for this government. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's a government that doesn't really feel shame, if we're going to be honest. And I mean, I think that, you know, and I always invite people to criticize, you know, what I have to say. Um, and, we, and we've talked even yesterday about I always want, you know, our criticisms and our assessments to be reasonable and fair on this show. And and one of the things that I think is fair and, and not so much even fair, but undeniable is that this is a government that went in opposition. I mean, Jason Kenney would go up one side of Rachel Notley and down the other about her lack of consultation, for example, with people in the agricultural trades or that, you know, around Bill 6 and the Farm Safety Act, as people were calling it. It's one example off the top of my head. I've talked to folks like you, curriculum experts. I've talked to Reeves and mayors. I've talked to counselors. I've talked to CEOs, executive directors, industry lobbyists, a whole bunch of people on the roster of this show who have said this government does not consult period. It rams through legislation. It comes up with ideas. It makes them happen. It's beholden to special interest groups. It pays the piper when it needs to. And at the same time, who's left holding the bag? I mean, I take conversations like this personally because I've got a little guy in grade one right now. Like you said, Dwayne, 25 year commitment. My little guy's going to be learning from this hot steaming pile. And so it puts more onto the parent, doesn't it? I mean, Dr. Grace, first of all, I love that you got through the call screeners on the weekend. Did you say who you actually were? And did, did, you, did you tell them what your actual question was going to be? Uh, how did you well, get through was, the call screeners? Well, that was the interesting thing is he asked me, what's my question? And I said, well, my question is, why are you, why are you, um, you know, why have you budgeted $191 million to put through a draft curriculum? And he says, oh, it's about the curriculum. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's garbage, right? And I'm like, I haven't finished my question yet. And he said, oh, yeah, you're good. And so he didn't hear my whole Are you question. talking about the call he screener or the premier? The I'm talking about the host of the show was okay. my call screener. Sure. Yeah. Okay. 
And then so, the premier rejects the premise of your question. What do you think he bristled at? What didn't he like about your question? He bristled that I mentioned over 40,000 Albertans, First Nation, Métis, Inuit, um, families with special needs, um, marginalized groups, school boards, trustees, and the teachers, 95% of teachers have opposed it. So he, to me, he rejected the premise that Albertans oppose his curriculum and that marginalized groups are not being respectfully included. Um, he also completely ignored my second question if he would be attending the April 2nd protest um, that's, that's across Alberta about this draft curriculum. Um, and then I was able, I, I didn't know my microphone was, I, I didn't know I was still on air when I laughed at him for rejecting the premise of my question. But what was funny was my husband and I talked about it in the morning and I said, you know what, I'm going to try to get through. I'm going to try to get through. Here's my question. And I said, I bet he rejects the premise. And sure <laughs> enough, he did. Yeah. But then my mic was still on. So I got to sneak in the second part about the consultation process in that he, you know, we have this online have your say survey that none of the results have been released to the public yet. So the public doesn't even know what we're, what people are saying. And then we have this, God knows how much money was spent on this, these, this 44 session engagement, engagement sessions with the Argyle group that they are submitting a report to Adriana Lagrange and she is the only one who's getting this. And I tell you, I attended three of those sessions and there were zero positive things said about the curriculum, zero. So we don't know how that report is going to be spun. We also have this very small minimalistic piloting of about 13 good weeks by less than 1% of schools and 2% of students that we, the public deserves to see what those piloting schools actually said about it. I've got uh, Scott here chiming in on our live chat. Sounds like he's worked on this himself in past. He says, I was involved in developing the physical education and the health elements of curriculum in past. I worked with some of the best in Canada and years of our work was just tossed. Uh, Dwayne, did, were you keeping an eye on that? Was that on your radar? I mean, the, the fact that there had been a curriculum overhaul already in development, that Alberta had already invested millions of dollars in this. I mean, uh, this this overhaul, it wasn't just starting from scratch. It wasn't taking something from the 1970s and saying, all right, we got to get around to fixing this, right? Right. Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, actively involved in what, you know, the previous government was doing, but I definitely was an interested, you know, observant. And uh, everything that I heard was very positive. Uh, I think, you know, there was a lot of really important work that was done. And for people who care about such things, a lot of a lot of uh, money invested in that process, right? And uh, I, I think it's important to say that I don't think that the previous iteration was perfect. There was a lot of work that needed to be done. No curriculum mm -hmm. sort of uh, conceptualization as never, you know, gets everything right. But it was a, a you know, the, the extensive consultation that you mentioned, I think was such an important part of it. And just this commitment to collaboration, which others have mentioned. I mean, we curriculum to me is such a important process, such an important endeavor that you can't just hang out with you know your friends when you when you want to create it. You, you have to take collaboration seriously. You have to be willing to engage with people who disagree with you because those are the, that's the character of a healthy society. So I'm not against you know listening to things that I don't agree with necessarily. But we don't have any leadership on that collaboration. That's the problem we have in this province. It's very divisive. Jason Kenney continues to say that he's seeking an, you know, a non-biased or non-ideological approach, which um, is just ridiculous. Yeah. It's the leadership problem that we have. That's I can tell that Carla and, and Angela both want to chime in on this. Carla, you've waited the longest. Why don't you go first? Well, I mean, I've been involved in curriculum development in various ways in Alberta since 2007. When I got here, moved here from uh, British Columbia, they were uh, just really getting going on implementing the social studies curriculum that's currently being taught in schools right now. And the plan for implementation for that curriculum extended over three, four or five years because they had... Um, 
uh, you know, a real, really well thought out plan. They knew that it would take time for teachers to become familiar with it. They knew that they needed to develop good resources and so on. So, you know, I'm sort of comparing the experiences that we've witnessed in the last couple of years to all of the previous years that I've been involved in curriculum development. I sat on a curriculum implementation committee and with a progressive conservative government. I've been involved in consultations through the years. And I yes, I was involved on a, uh, I guess you'd call it sort of a validation group um, uh, that uh, that reviewed the work of the people who were writing the curriculum uh, under um, the NDP government. We looked at that work and, and provided feedback in order to, to help it, you know, continue to be strengthened and to, and to be as good as it could be. And Dwayne's absolutely right. There's no such thing as a perfect curriculum, but when you begin a curriculum development pr uh, process, in such a flawed manner as has been done under this government with almost no consultation or consultation only by people who agree with the vision of the government and anybody else who disagrees is considered a left-wing wing nut or a union, uh, you know, freak or whatever. Lackey, NDP um, apologist, yeah. Rachel Notley Bootlicker, I've heard right, them all, exactly. yeah. exactly. Um, you know, radical downtown urbanite. I think that's my favorite. Over caffeinated one. lefty. We can go on, <laughs> Dr. Peck. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when you cast people who disagree with you that way, then, you know, you're, you're, you've got a scorched earth policy or approach to any kind of relationship building so that there's no attempt at all to actually engage with people who have different views. Never mind the fact that there's been no attempt to engage with people who actually have curriculum expertise in this province. Angela? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Carla. So in 2017, I was approached um, by a community organization saying, hey, you know, you're an eating disorder prevention specialist. Um, can I put your name forth to review the draft? Well, so the backstory is I was an elementary teacher. And a group of my little grade one girls started a diet club and they were throwing out their lunches, running the lap, running laps around the playground to lose weight. And they were six years old. Wow. And I thought, I have to do something about this. So I went to grad school, became a psychologist, um, started my PhD. I, I really wanted to work in eating disorder prevention. So I started my PhD in, in um, 2000, oh gosh, 2009. And I spent like it took me down this rabbit hole of health at every size. It took me down the rabbit hole of comprehensive school health, of health promotion in school, of, of prevention in schools. And so I literally spent six years studying everything I could about the overlap between mental health and education. And so when I was invited to review the curriculum, I went up in 2017. I had to I had to give a, a 10 minute um, a 10 minute speech, like saying to the committee why I would be a good person to review this. And then I was selected. So when I reviewed this, the draft that was put before me, I was, I, I was in shock. I was like, this is not, I stood up in a room in front of 150 other people reviewing the curriculum. And I said, this curriculum has an eating disorder. I said, you can't have, you can't have calorie counting. You can't have um, weighing and measuring kids. You can't have these things. And I said, also, that's just a small part of it. There's a whole layer of comprehensive school health that is multiple, multiple layers of all the dimensions of health. And then I said to them, you've got some contradictions here. This document here says First Nation, Métis, Inuit inclusion. And yet the draft I'm seeing has nothing. Yeah. So where's the medicine wheel? Where are the elders? Where are the knowledge keepers? Where, where's the consultation? I sat with a woman from the Sheldon Kennedy Center and we talked for an hour about how consent should be approached in all of the different grades. So what I'm doing now against the curriculum, I already did in 2017. And over the next year, those curriculum experts, the ones who actually wrote it, took the best practice recommendations and put it into the draft. So when I was invited back to review it in 2018, there was this relief that it was all there. And then I knew there, were going to, there was going to be an extensive, like Carla said, no curriculum's perfect. We need it. We need it ground tested in the schools to see 
how children respond, how teachers can teach it. So I knew that there was going to be a piloted draft and that I would be invited back again to review it. And that never happened. So Jason Kenney had a bee in his bonnet about the social studies curriculum and 120,000 war dead that he insisted be in the elementary curriculum. It, there was still the junior and senior high curriculums to develop. It was going to be there. The, the previous minister of education, David Egan, like it was all like it was all laid out and he says it's preposterous that it's going to be thrown out for political reasons but it is crystal clear that before jason kenny even had a draft to review he was bound and determined to throw this out trust me alberta parents this has nothing to do with your children and everything to do with his ideology and desire for absolute power you know i'm in in a situation right now where I, I realized that I could keep the three of you for about 10 hours and we could dig in and we could go grade by grade, subject by subject. And I would just ask basically, Dr. Donald, your turn. What's so messed up about this one? And then we could really dig into it. But we don't have time. And I still need to leave a couple of minutes to ask you about charter schools because the government's dumping a whole bunch of dollars into charter schools, parents' choice in education. I am inclined to support parents' choice in education. To me, this is not a non-starter, but I want to pick your brains, the three of you on this but before we transition i don't want to leave this undone for now like we said the government is pressing pause on implementing this new math and english curriculum for grade four to six so maybe that's a positive step maybe that's some sort of acknowledgement that it that it needs more work but i'd like to give each of you an opportunity to kind of wrap up your thoughts because people will be asking parents educators engaged citizens well where do we go from here like what's the deal like what did this cover like okay we know that it's a mess but but now what so, uh, Dr. Donald, now what? Well, in general, I would just say it's symptomatic of, of a rushed process and, and just trying to recover from, you know, all the steps that have been missed and uh, taking a little time. I, I mean, I don't really see anything significant in the drafts that, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in what I think of, the, you know, the indigenous content in there, really, really, it's just a sprinkling in these different topics. There, there's nothing that's taken up with any depth or anything like that. So um, do you feel yeah, like it's, do you feel like is... it's kind of being tokenized, doctor? Like, do you, do you feel like it's kind of like, ah, oh, we better have some indigenous content in there. So throw a little, is that kind of how it feels? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that how you're feeling about it? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a classic anthropological approach. And, and most of what's, what I've seen in the different drafts, is based on you know how things were in the past and again we have this difficulty where indigenous people aren't, aren't allowed to be uh living you know breathing happy successful people you know making decisions in, in this world that we live in today most of what's there is sort of uh looking back so dr peck what now well uh the online engagement sessions that Angela spoke about a moment ago, uh, only ended uh, 17 days ago. And we haven't seen the report yet from the company that was engaged to do those sessions. We also haven't seen any of the other feedback that the pages and pages that I know uh, curriculum experts have provided, hundreds of pages that have been provided, all of the feedback sessions that have been, or surveys that have been collected, uh, from parents and any other person who wanted to provide feedback, we need to see what that feedback says. And we need to see it before any more decisions are made about the curriculum. Because like Angela, I was in a session, uh, the, one of the online sessions for social studies, zero good things were said about it, none. Were said in two in a two hour session. Nobody had one word to say that was positive. So we need to see the feedback. We've paid for that feedback, by the way, because uh, all of this, you know, these companies that do this work don't do it for free. And so, just from a taxpayer perspective, I want to see it. But also from an ethical perspective, it's a crucially important that we know what the experts are saying about the curriculum before we impose it on children. Curriculum is ultimately about the future 
about the kind of future that we envision for our children, for our society. And we cannot get this wrong. In closing, I want to ask the three of you, uh, Dr. Grace, I'll start with you. Alberta's going to spend, at, at last count, it looks to me, just over $70 million in, in helping some new charter schools establish themselves. Uh, the premier says he'd like to see an expansion of this. In his words, a flowering of new charter schools, um, loosening the rules for their creation, making it easier. Um, do you have any concerns with regards to this? It's, 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 it's a different way of learning. I'm not sure that the majority of people could clearly articulate, including me, could clearly articulate the biggest difference between a charter school and, a, and another education model. But um, I have seen people, and, and again, I want to acknowledge, I keep saying this, but a lot of people just can't fucking stand Jason Kenney. And so anything he does, they hate it. But are charter schools inherently bad? Are there red flags? Is this a cool, different way of learning? Is it a better fit for some people? In closing, Angela, you first. What's your assessment? Well, so I haven't. I mean, charter schools are great. It's it's important that that parents have choice. Um, charter schools can meet some needs that other schools can't. However, have, that public schools can't always do. However, the issue is. Charter schools, and I've had a child in my life who was rejected from three charter schools that said, oh, we can't meet his needs because he has autism. So the very thing that we needed extra help with, they, they refused, they refused him. Um, so my major concern is that charter schools used to need to go through a vetting process with the local school board. They used to have, they required, you know, extensive backing as to why this charter was important. And what's happened, basically, Jason Kenney has pulled an Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, a charter school for you and a charter school for you and a charter school for you. And if we look at some of these backgrounds, there are some of the buddies and some of the people that have worked with Adriana Lagrange, and all of a sudden they're getting a charter school. One other thing I'm going to put: the Alberta Distance Learning Center was a critically important component of of public school, and all of a sudden it's been replaced by this charter of Ignite Learning Center. What happened to our public Alberta Distance Learning Center? So my concern is not with charter schools itself; it's concern with the process by which they're being handed out. Okay, Carla? I have a different take. Um, for me, the expansion of charter schools means that money is being taken out of the public education system. Uh, one of the key differences is that charter schools don't have elected school board trustees. Uh, and so they're run you know, by sort of private entities and um, they're receiving public money, money, but don't necessarily have public accountability. Um, and so that's my biggest concern. School choice, great. Not, nothing wrong with school choice. In fact, lots of good things with school choice because students, children can find sort of places where they will thrive. And that's important and everybody should want that for children in Alberta and across Canada. But we already have lots of school choice. We have tons of school choice in Edmonton public alone. That's just one school board as an example. So my big concern is in addition to um, you know the, the oversight uh, and review process that was changed uh, with the new legislation is um, the draining of money from the public school system. Uh, Dr. Donald, last word to you, my friend. Well, my mind goes to the neoliberal playbook and what we know is, is uh, you know, it's, it's geared towards disabling public institutions by defunding them mm -hmm. and then saying they're dysfunctional, we need to get rid of them. And then what happens is this, this thing we call school choice comes in and it's basically, again, a market approach to education where you can shop around to decide which, which store you want to frequent, right? I, I guess for me, what's at stake, Brian, is, is what unifies us as a society. What, you know, what are our values? What do we consider most important for our children? And I just see, I mean, I, I agree with what uh, Dr. Grace and Dr. Peck said that, you know, school choice in itself and, and this idea that, you know, we have different ways to meet children's needs is an important consideration, of course, but I just worry that it's going to enhance this divisiveness that we already have. We have these special interest groups that are going to go off into their own camps. And uh, it's, it's kind of an American model, to, to be blunt, about how to address these issues. And uh, 
I'm just really concerned that it's, it's going to create more of this divisiveness that is growing in our society. And, and I don't want that. Time has flown through the course of this conversation. We, we've kept the three of you a little later than we asked you to stay, and I'm grateful for that. I hope we haven't got you in any trouble with your next Zoom meeting or any students or anything like that, mentors type things. That, you know, you have these commitments, but we sure have. I mean, this, the, you know, really, when, when it comes to what we spend the most on with regards to our government budgets, it, it's health and education. It, typically, it's, it's what's most important to people, generally speaking, and, and uh, we sure appreciate your insights. Uh, you've been hearing from Dr. Dwayne Donald, Dr. Carla Peck, and Dr. Angela Grace. We're grateful for your expertise and your real talk. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having us. Of course, we know that uh, when we talk education, Sarah, no surprise to you, we're going to see our download numbers spike today. People care. People give a rip. <laughs> so people are going to be back in. Uh, maybe they haven't checked out Real Talk for a while. But when you start talking about curriculum, uh, that's what people really engage. You can send us your feedback to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We'd love to hear from you, especially parents, teachers, uh, school board officials, trustees. I mean, people that are directly impacted by this. What about young learners, the youngest members of our listening audience? We have kids that tune in with their parents. My apologies. For the, for the moments where sometimes I use what we would call a punch word to really make a point. The younger learners sometimes learn new phrases here on Real Talk. That's what their parents tell us. But if you're 15 or 16 or 18 or 20 and this is impacting you directly, we want to hear from you too, including conversations on things like post-secondary funding. There's a lot going on in that realm too, and we want to make sure that what matters to you is on our radar. Talk at ryanjesperson.com. Speaking of post-secondary, if you're someone that's got a big idea, you've got big ambition, but you need to find kind of the circle where you can meet those contacts, you can do that networking, you can get plugged in, so to speak. Have you checked out Nate's J.R. Shaw School of Business? Go to nate.ca or just Google the Nate J.R. Shaw School of Business. You find the business career that's right for you. You can get down to business, follow the links, and learn more about why you might choose Nate, you know, 86% employment rate. That's what Nate boasts within nine months of graduating from full-time programs. Nearly nine out of 10 graduates are working in the industry within nine months of graduating. Unbelievable. 94% of their graduates are satisfied with their overall educational experience. And the people that hire them, the employers, 95% of them say that it's a great fit. Employer satisfaction numbers are off the charts. How great is that? One of Nate's greatest competitive advantages is its connection to industry. That's why people go there. You can learn more about the J.R. Shaw School of Business programs at nate.ca. Also want to remind you that our friends at Friesen Brothers are proudly family-owned and operating after 65 years in 16 different Alberta communities still going strong Alberta grown, Alberta owned. They understand how important it is to put quality food on your family table. It's what drives them, what inspires them and motivates them to be featuring the freshest and best produce, sourdough bread, the real Alberta beef, pork, chicken, turkey that they're so proud of from their real Alberta butchers. You can find out more about what they're doing online at Friesen.com. Our friends at Local Environmental know what it means to be able to have a trusting relationship when you're putting a big part of your business into the hands of somebody else. That's why they're always looking to compete for your business by way of a requested quote at localenvironmental.ca. If you own a retail location, maybe you're managing a hotel, maybe you're in charge of certain infrastructure, maybe you're working with a city, a town, a village, you got to come up with a contract that makes sense when it comes to waste and recycling management, portable toilets, temporary fencing, water services, you name it, Local Environmental does it, and you can find them online at localenvironmental.ca. Still got room for a couple of trash talk submissions, by the way, tomorrow. You can email those to us. Of course, that's presented by the team at Local. And before we get to our next interview, let me tell you a little bit more about Infinity Healthcare. You may have someone in your life, maybe it's grandma or grandpa, mom or dad, maybe it's your spouse, your partner, your sibling, somebody that needs to get into a care type scenario. But an assisted living facility is just not for them. They don't want it. 
You don't want it, but you need to find a solution. At Infinity Healthcare, they work hard with personality matching to make sure that a home care scenario is the perfect fit for the person that you love so dearly. All kinds of factors might come into play. Infinity works with you to make sure they find the home care provider that your loved one can trust. Because nothing's more important in this relationship than trust. You can start that conversation by visiting them online at infinity 8.ca or you'll find Infinity Healthcare under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Well, I'm looking forward to a conversation in just a second uh, with an expert who, who literally has wrote the book on Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Ray Newton's going to join us in, in just a second. But first, let's get to why everybody's talking about Kim Kardashian. This week, everybody's always talking about Kim Kardashian, but she and her family, her mom and her sisters did an interview with Variety, and she talked about what it takes to succeed. Here's an excerpt. I have the best advice for women in business. Get your fucking ass up and work. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. You That's have to, so true. You have to surround yeah. yourself with people that want to work have a good work environment where everyone loves what they do because you have one life no toxic work environments and show up and do the work so some people are pissed off ray newtson's a writer specializing in nonfiction essays and reported features on beauty fashion and pop culture you may have read her work in esquire the cut vox and other outlets she's the author of all made up pitfalls of beauty culture from cleopatra to kim kardashian making a real talk debut ray it's great to have you here thanks for making time for us yeah thank you so much for having me uh, when kim kardashian said that did it rub you the wrong way or did you go yeah she's not wrong i mean both i guess i mean i think that it does take hard work to be successful in a lot of things i don't think she's incorrect and i think she does work hard um, but i think a lot of people work hard and not a lot of people are billionaires and not a lot of people run, you know, multi-million dollar companies. So I think that it's not just as simple as working hard. I think that there's other factors at play. And to say that it just takes hard work is often incorrect. What do you think it is about her in particular that so infuriated people with the comments? I mean, is, is it the idea that, that she grew up with the silver spoon? Do you think that's it? Are people under the impression that, that everything came easy to Kim Kardashian? Yeah, I think that definitely is part of it. I think that she did come from wealth and has created more wealth for herself that a lot of people don't have access to. And that gets rid of a lot of barriers that other people are facing. She, you know, has help with childcare. She has help cleaning the house. She has help doing other things that open up time for her to be able to work hard and put the work in that other people don't have access to. I think that also she you know is beautiful she makes part of her living on her looks and her appearance and on being beautiful and that has a lot of other different you know structural things at play she's white her body shape is a certain way um, she has you know access to makeup and resources to procedures that make her look a certain way that other people don't have access to i think also the comment coming at a time right now during a pandemic when a lot of women in particular were pushed out of the workforce to, you know, care for families, to care for children because they couldn't be supported, you know, in their work. It, you know, it may struck people as being particularly tone deaf right now. What, what prompted you, like what, what fascinated you so much about her uh, to, to, to essentially write the book. I mean, your, your book's bigger picture. It's, it, you didn't like write an autobiography about Kim Kardashian, mm -hmm. but, but you certainly, when you put her on the front cover, you know it's going to get people's mm -hmm. attention. And you loop her in with Cleopatra. That's quite a comparison. If I was Kim Kardashian, I'd be pretty stoked about that. <laughs> yeah, I think that throughout history, there have been examples of women who use their appearance to kind of leverage more power or once they have been in power their appearance has kind of set the beauty standards for the society that they've been in so i think you know when we live in a sexist society that we do live in women's appearance is kind of intrinsically tied to the power that they have and kim kardashian is such a good modern example of how that can work about how you can use your image to leverage influence and wealth and power and create more of it in part based on the way that she looks. So she became a really interesting case study to kind of look at how makeup can really affect somebody's life. And she has built an empire on it. She sells the makeup 
that she uses to create the appearance that she uses um, and says to people, you know, if you use this makeup too, you can maybe have the life that I have. Hmm. Hear people talk. I was having this conversation just the other day. I was talking to a buddy about how we're managing screen screen time for our little kids, you know, like six years old, and it'll become probably more of an issue. And you talk to parents of tweens and they'll go, you know, the, the real problem is Instagram or TikTok. And there's evidence, there's research that shows this so-called beauty culture or, or this obsession with with chasing perfection. I mean, we just talked to education experts right before we talked to you mm-hmm. and we've got a registered psychologist telling us she had to break up when she was an elementary school teacher, a diet club in grade one with six year olds that were throwing their lunch out. I mean, as you did your research, you did your deep dive to write this book on beauty culture. Did like the onset of social media, the advent of it mm-hmm. obviously changes the game a little bit, uh, probably a lot. Uh, but generally speaking, what have been the biggest changes through the years? I mean, this has always kind of been an issue, right? Insecurities, celebrities, the obsession over the pursuit of perfection. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, as long as people have existed and been able to see each other, this has been, you know, an issue. People feel pressured to look a certain way. They receive benefits from looking a certain way. But I think that with the advent of technology that spreads people's images faster, Um, You know, with print technology, you see that shift where people can see what they look like faster, that gets spread around the world faster. And with social media in particular, now images are, you know, more important than ever. They can travel around the world in a second. People everywhere have access to cameras that they can post on the internet. So it's very, very influential right now. And people, you know, are surrounded by images and the influence of those images. So yeah, it can create a very high pressure environment that a lot of people are trying to figure out how to deal with. Do people misread or misunderstand Kim Kardashian? Like I've seen a lot of people kind of, quite frankly, the majority of my friends kind of just write her off or I mean, the majority of my friends don't care at all, but, but they they sort of dismiss her like, nah, like, you know, her dad was OJ's lawyer. They've got tons of dough. She had everything, you know, she had a sex tape. It was successful. You know, she and her mom orchestrated the sex tape. Probably it launched her into stardom and yada, yada. But at the same time I sit there and I go, she's she's crazy. Like a Fox, like she's brilliant. She's built a billion dollar empire. Her sisters have, is it disrespectful to say piggybacked on her success and built their own empires and, Uh, I don't begrudge someone for being successful. Do people underestimate Kim Kardashian? Absolutely. I think people underestimate Kim Kardashian. And I think that that's part of, you know, the beauty that she wields. It's kind of a double-edged sword. It gains her access to certain things. It gains her certain privileges, but it can also be used as a weapon against her. People can say like, oh, she's just all about appearance. It's superficial. And that can, you know, lead to people underestimating her or not taking her as seriously. But she does work hard. She's very smart. She's very savvy. Not everyone could do what she does. And I think that people do underestimate, you know, the skills and and the brains and the hard work that she does input into her businesses. Hmm. What's something, uh, this is one of my favorite questions to ask because I just want to say, I've not read your book cover to cover, but I would love to have you provide us with some insight into something that has nothing to do with Kim Kardashian. But the jumping off point, I want this interview to be more about Kim, more than just about Kim Kardashian. You write about the pitfalls of beauty culture. What's something else that, that occurred to you or, or maybe even an epiphany or a moment, an aha moment you had in putting that book together? Uh, something that maybe changed the way that you view life or uh, changed your perspective as the author of that book? Yeah, I think just looking historically at the way people use makeup, like throughout cultures and throughout history, um, it really kind of blew my mind in a way that it has you know always been here people have always been dealing with this and and how seriously it can affect people's lives um one area that i look at in the book is safety how people can use makeup and use their appearance to try to make their world a little bit safer especially if they don't fit into the current standards of society and so for example people in court cases if women are in court trying to um you know, press charges against someone, or if they had, you know, a crime committed against them, they're trying to look a certain way so that the jury will take them seriously. Or if they're accused of a crime, um, I know in my book, I talked, you know, there was a woman in the twenties who was accused of a crime that she likely didn't commit, but because she didn't fit into society standards, people more easily saw her as a criminal. So I think that, you know, makeup and people's appearance has real serious effects on people's lives and taking it seriously, 
you know, isn't a bad thing. It's not frivolous. It's not silly. It really affects people every day. Uh, Ray, I'm so grateful that you made time to talk to us today. Thanks for this. Uh, people need to check out your book, All Made Up. They can find it anywhere you order great books. Uh, we've been talking to Ray Knudsen. Uh, you can check out raynudson.com. Thanks for this. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Johnny, you want to pull up that one tweet that you showed about cutting Kim Kardashian a break? Uh, I, I thought that was one that kind of jumped out at me. Is is uh, I mean, keep in mind there's other stuff going on too, right? This was from someone, uh, Megan Elizabeth, on Twitter says, "I think we need to cut Kim a break here. She's currently being harassed by her ex." That's a wild story, by the way. Kanye uh, says, "I don't think she meant anything negative by work hard." Yes, a lot's been handed to her, but you can't deny that she too has worked really hard. Where do you land on it? I think there's there's just too many there's too many factors here. Like when you bring in the Kanye thing, like I think it, you know it's just abuse online. It doesn't matter who it is. But then you go back to Kim Kardashian. I think people just have people have an issue about how she entered into fame. Yeah, you know she was hanging out with Paris Hilton. She was trying to be famous. Then all of a sudden, you know, there's the sex tape appears. Yeah, there's rumors her and her mom kind of formulated the plot to yeah. kind of get that out there. It's not confirmed. I'm just you know talking about what's out there, and uh, so I don't know. You know, I used to be very annoyed by her. My wife watches the show. I've watched a lot of it. They've got a new show coming out. They've That's... got a great new show. Well, I don't want to say great because I, I mean, if it's anything like that trailer ride, it's going to be fabulous content. But yeah. I think uh, I don't know. I think it's just it's like a multifaceted situation. And I think uh, there's people who love her. There's people who hate her. And these days, I mean, people are making money on social media doing absolutely nothing. So what is she doing that's so different? I don't really think, you know, there's much difference in, you know, someone being on TikTok or, yeah. or TV. Right. So Jillian on our live chat says the way that folks overanalyze and quickly attack everything women say is part 100%. of how we try to silence women. Everything that women say is is nitpicked. While men threaten the lives of guys they don't like, no, it's no problem. Uh, did the did did the quote? I'll be honest. I was like, for me, that when I heard her, like, and she's like, "Get off your fucking ass and work." People don't want to work these days. I was like, "Uh huh." <laughs> I did. I don't know. I, I mean, uh, maybe people get angry because people just don't like her inherently. But how did how did it land with you when you first heard it? I disagree fundamentally that people don't work hard these days. I, I fundamentally disagree with that. There are people that are working two, three jobs. For sure. Um, just trying to make ends meet. And our minimum wage is not actually keeping pace with the cost of living. So that to me is garbage right out of the gates. But do you think that she was she wasn't talking about like is minimum wage keeping pace with the cost of living? She's she's talking about what she sees around her, right? Like I like are we expecting uh, is, is she like but, but is she, she President Joe Biden's appointed director of minim, of poverty reduction? Like she's <laughs> not, right? Right. But if you look at that story, somebody that actually worked for her said that she was paid minimally okay she had to call in sick some days because she couldn't afford yeah to actually get to work so she has it she's part of the problem she is part of the problem that people are not like paid. she's not paying her staff fairly correct yeah so uh, do i think that there, this is multifaceted yes do i think that she had a head start yes do i think that she's committed some time to this and to her ventures, yes. But she's a social climber. She has used her relationships and she's upgraded her relationships. Um, and maybe that's what you have to do if you want to be famous. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. also the idea that, you know, stop making stupid people famous. <laughs> but that's, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know what, you know what a, a, a down home example is? Is Captain Kobe that we had on the show a Perfect. couple, a couple of weeks ago, right? Don't get me started, oh, dude. No, no, hey. It's enough. Uh, I, I, I don't mean it's enough, Sarah Hoyles. I'm not saying that. Let me be clear. Oh. I'm saying my point is my point is Captain Kobe. And He's, the thing he with actually, Captain Kobe. He reemphasizes what my point is. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you know what? Lots of people give a fuck about what he has to say. And so that's that people's interest. People are like, why are you making certain people famous? That's because that's who those people want to listen to. He's already and if, famous. And if you don't like it, then that's fine. He's already famous. I'm like, saying you know, that they're ev dangerous. Ev but every single person that has been successful, not every single person, but many people, have leveraged connections. 
I have leveraged connections to be successful. I am a social climber. Many people do not like me. I was born with privilege. I had private education. I grew up in an upper middle class home in the suburbs. All of this is accurate. All of this is relevant, but it doesn't diminish what I do. You know, and I think it's important to have these perspectives. Kim Kardashian has what three hundred million Instagram followers. It's something. It's it's out it's of absolutely it, it's wild. Like, but no, why is that important? But, well, no, but Sarah, three hundred million people want to follow her on Instagram. That's their fucking choice. They can follow her if they want, and they don't have to follow her. It's not like the U two album that was like imposed on people and downloaded into their Apple Music. It's not the same thing. People want to, so who cares? Like I, I don't, I, I don't I, understand the hater. I don't understand. Like I, I, she's not my flavor. Kanye's not even my flavor, quite frankly. I don't even like. I don't even <laughs> think Kanye West is that talented. People, Careful, people can come at me. I know that people think he's a genius. I don't even. I think Kanye's totally overrated. But that's my choice to like him or not like him. Okay, so overrated. Look, genius even for me is pushing it. But a hip hop icon, a guy who changed the game, like his first, second, third albums, all platinum, all Grammy award winners. Uh, his first, al- he's just he's five steps ahead in terms of artistry for his position in music all the time. His work with Donda, these live shows outside. But again, then you go to the man and it becomes this mixed bag. And I get what Sarah's saying right now. Like, stop making stupid people famous. But at the same time, I like the fact that the average person can just climb out from the rubble and become a social media icon or even a millionaire in this day and age. Yeah. But and she I, hasn't climbed out from the rubble. Stop. I'm not talking about her. He's I'm not saying about in her. general. Like we're talking about Captain Kobe. We're talking about other people. But he also has, if we're talking Captain Kobe, he is a white male, which automatically gives him. So what people, do you want him to do, Sarah? Pe- I'm saying that th- there is not an equal playing field. To but what do you want him to do? Uh <laughs> Many things. Like what? Um, the fact that he's talking about that he wants to go and talk to indigenous people. Um, great. But the point is, it's not about going and giving your mic to someone else. It's about getting the fuck out of the way <laughs> and letting people speak for themselves and take, stop taking up airtime. He's not taking up airtime. He, he is his own guy with his own Twitter account. You know what Captain Kobe's biggest mistake was, honestly? He built this following accidentally. He just set up a TikTok and, and, and he set up a Twitter account and all of a sudden he had a quarter million followers on TikTok. And he goes, it's always been my dream. This is He said it on our show. People can go back and listen to the interview. He goes, it's always been my dream. He goes, I want to go across the country on a motorcycle and talk to people and tell people stories. And he goes, including First Nations people, including Indigenous people. And then all of a sudden, the left starts to pile on him and say, oh, yeah, no, oh, a white guy is going gonna, is gonna to co-opt the culture. 100%. And 100%, Sarah, you know it. He said, I don't and, know it. And so, so the biggest mistake that Captain Kobe made was acknowledging that he wanted to include indigenous people in the conversations he had. Because, the, because people started lighting their hair on fire. So the better thing he would have done, what everybody would have preferred... Right. All the Stacy's, what everybody would have preferred is if Captain Kobe is if Captain Kobe would have just 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 ignored indigenous people altogether and said, I'm just going to ride my motorcycle across the country and just and and, but I'm not going to talk to any indigenous people. And then and then all of the Stacy's online would be would would be more satisfied. We should not be diminishing people and referring to them as Stacy's. No, I'm specifically talking about someone called Stacy. But you used st- anyways. My my concern is is yes, he became famous because he had some really concise takes on the co- freedom convoys. The reason why that voice mattered in that is because the freedom convoys are a whole bunch of white guys. But who are you to so, say the reason why the voice mattered? Are you are you like are, who's the gatekeeper that determines whose voice matters? The reason why it was so, it resonated was because he was. He was talking, he was, he looked just like the guys that are leading the charge on the Freedom Convoy. So yes, his point of view mattered and was different. And that's why I believe it resonated. And the, and to then, for him to then veer off and to start having, saying all different kinds of things, that's where I took issue with. Like, stay, <laughs> he, I, he spoke out of turn, he spoke for people that he had no he right, still, he has every right. He has every right to say whatever. No, he, he doesn't. Wants. Of course, he does. No, Sarah. he doesn't. Who says? Who says? 
indigenous people that say you cannot not, speak for me. Who is he? Who is who? Like, uh, by the way, this is the most real talk we've had in a long time. I'm in the middle. I know some here. people are pissed off about this. This is real talk. I love this. W- show me one example of Captain Kobe speaking on behalf of indigenous people. Like one example I, anywhere. I all I can say is the GoFundMe and saying that he's going to go do that. I, he said he wants to ride I, his motorcycle and go on a road trip. That's what why he said. are you defending him so much? I'm not defending Captain Kobe. What I'm defending is this cancel culture. Not that, cancel uh, yes, culture. It, of oh cu- my gosh! Of stop. course it is. You, you you are going from to extremes. You're I'm going not. to extremes. I'm saying I'm actually dumbing it down, and I'm saying that Captain Kobe is just a guy who has a free to follow. In other words, if you don't like, you can block him if you don't like him. If you don't want to listen to what he says, he's just a guy. Who says, I've got some, he throws stuff out there like, hey, what are you doing? How are you guys doing today? What are some, he's, he's like just a guy. And, he's, and he has a GoFundMe. It's not publicly funded. Nobody, nobody's giving him money that doesn't want to. You can set up a GoFundMe today to do whatever you want. That's the idea of it. It's a crowdfunded, crowdsourced thing. And he goes, I have this idea. And if you want to support him, support him. And if you don't want to support him, don't support him. I don't, have a, I don't have an iron in the fire for Captain Kobe, but I look at the story and I sit there and I go, I don't understand why so many people, uh, just this guy is just living in their heads and they wake up and they check his Twitter and, and try to find ways to attack him. Like, if you don't like him, just block him or walk away from him. I, I, don't, under, I don't understand. I, I agree that it's important, like, even with, like, Rex Murphy, for instance, whenever he has a post, people hate read it and then hate tweet about it. Yeah. And so... I agree that stop making stupid people famous. <laughs> this is great. And I'm kind of in the middle here. Like, I see Ryan's point of view, but I, I mean, a lot of people on the text line agreeing with Sarah and some people agreeing with Ryan as well. But I think the point Sarah's trying to make, you know, and I like when Ryan says everyone's got a voice, they can say what they want. And he was trying to help with, uh, you know, trying to give indigenous people a voice. But I agree. I have to agree with Sarah, which is just just get out of the way. Uh, like He's I would have been. You listen, guys, let me doesn't. say one thing. I would have been better if he had just given his platform, his Instagram, his Twitter, to an indigenous person for the day, and maybe not he, introduce maybe he them fucking will, you guys. Maybe he will. Like maybe he will. He's not done anything yet. He hasn't. He's just a guy. I understand. He's crowdfunding to go on a road trip. Everybody's like, did did I miss the point where he like released a documentary on the history of indigenous people in Canada? And did like did did I miss that part? It's, he said he wants to go across. He did. It's not an indigenous visiting road trip. It's a motorcycle trip across the country. Agree. Right? And, I and love I'm just Kobe. this is this is just fact. I'm not I'm not defending him or whatever. I'm I'm saying that the, the fact of the matter is is that his GoFundMe is he wants to ride a motorcycle across the country and meet people and tell people stories and talk to people and learn. Like that's like it's like any other documentary that anybody would do that anybody could crowdfund. You know what I'm saying? Like he's he's not he never set out. We asked him about it specifically in the interview, and he talks about it specifically. And I don't know how anybody could watch the interview that he did with us and leave there saying this is a guy that's trying to to appropriate indigenous culture in Canada or to stifle indigenous voices. But he also agreed that he made a mistake in how he went about it. Yeah, sure, because he's just a guy. Yeah, right. He I don't think that he knew what he was getting into. Would you agree? Like, I don't think he had any idea what he was getting into. I don't think he had any idea what he was getting into. And I maybe think... that's when you should stay out, right, Sam? <laughs> can I, can I <laughs> finish? Ahead, can sorry. I finish? Um, that he didn't know what he was getting into. But when he was, when people offered to guide him and to give him constructive feedback, he shut them down and he used dismissive language uh, some harsh, some not so harsh. And that's where I take issue. Like, this is where people that have privilege can't see their goddamn privilege. So it's important that they actually open their ear, shut up and open their ears. I mean, I mean, in the live chat, someone just said, you know, like a whole bunch of white people talking about us. 100%. And I'm like, so I'm guilty, and I I agree. No, oh my it, god, I agree for sure. And and so should and and real talk. So should we just not have conversations. Should we just not talk about it. Like I see the comments about white people talking, but does it, like because there are three white people in a room, right? And 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 this show has made a very serious and meaningful commitment to providing 
a platform and an opportunity for voices to be heard from a first person lived experience perspective. But does this mean that are you disqualified from having any opinion or having any talk? I mean, it's getting to the point where, I mean, a show like this, like Real Talk, better start living up to its name every once in a while and having uncomfortable conversations people talking to me about i don't know cancel culture like do you fucking forget my story like do, i don't know cancel culture you fucking kidding me i have firsthand experience what it's like and i've encountered the same crew on social media right i don't know if you saw the email we got an email from a woman i'm not going to read it and i'm not going to say her name because she asked me not to she was subject to bullying from this online group that went after kobe she's from a very different background than kobe she says that she had suicidal ideation she was pushed to the point of considering ending her life based on the bullying that she was encountering online this is not a one-way street and sure, Kobe called some people bitches and he started talking about Mean Girls, which is the title of a movie. And, and on this show, he said he would have taken that back. And as far as I could tell, he reconciled with the ringleader, with that gang leader there. But at the same time, is the assertion that that basically if, if you've got a beard and you're white, you should just shut the fuck up, shut down your social media, shut the fuck up? Because that's the impression I get. That's what a lot of people seem to think he should do. What I say. Oh, boy. There are, I mean, we even talked about it. There's a Saturday Night Live <laughs> skit about the white guy Lego kit for podcasts. And so do we need another white guy having a podcast? No, there are no rules against it. It's free market. People can listen to whatever they want. But there's a lot of space and a lot of airtime and a lot of oxygen being used up so I'm saying share that space make space and the part of that is getting the hell out of the way and I see that my, I have a role in this and I you know am editorial producer of the show and so I I hear that and that makes me reflect on the work I do and how do I want to do better and that's a daily process for you and I see it and I know it and I think that people probably see it with regards to the finished product of who you see and hear on the show here every single day. If this conversation has ignited something in you, if you're infuriated or if you're passionately involved or if you've got something that you want to say, now's the time to say it to us. By way of our email account, you get us at talk at ryanjesperson.com. Our hashtag is RealTalkRJ. That's where you can get us on Twitter. That is powered by the team at Park Power. You know they're in the business of internet, electricity, and natural gas across the province of Alberta right now, and it's never been a better time to bring your business over with uncertainty around what pricing looks like, electricity and natural gas, you may want to take a look at their fixed rate options. You can find it online at parkpower.ca. You can learn about the company. Based out of Sherwood Park, Alberta, by the way, a family-owned company, a great success story, not your traditional corporate utilities provider. Frequently asked questions there on the website. Make sure you use the promo code 2022 Dash Real Talk. When you're bringing your business over, you're going to save $70 off your first bill. If you're considering a new career, if you're at that crossroads in your life where you're going, what am I going to do next? You're looking where business is going, where are trends and opportunities. Right now, it's AI, artificial intelligence. But along with the technological implementations comes the ethical questions. Enter Power Ed by Athabasca University. Their artificial intelligence ethics micro-credential is a course that you could complete in a week or two at your own pace. You can check out the overview and the reasons why so many people are looking to AI for their next career opportunity at powered.athabascau.ca. St. Albert and Sherwood Dodges, who my family trusts when it comes to new vehicles, not just on the sales side, but on the service side as well. They're so proud of not just the return business of their longtime customers, but of the referrals as well. That's why I'm proud to recommend that you check out Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge, whether it's maybe a vehicle, maybe your family's downsizing, fuel costs are getting up there and you're looking for something a little bit smaller, more compact, or maybe you're looking for something to pull your fifth wheel. They've got the full lineup of Jeep, Dodge, of course, the celebrated Ram truck lineup. You can find them under the Sponsors tab. Shop online at ryanjesperson.com. And our friends at Eden Landscaping want you to know they're starting to book up. They've still got a couple of appointments available for the next couple of weeks to start taking a look at your 
Dream Outdoor Landscaping Project. They're bringing outdoor spaces to life. They have done for 20 plus years. Right now, a perfect time to get started because construction materials, shipping, availability, it's a little bit tight. Check out landscapeedmonton.ca. Coming up on the show tomorrow, of course, you know it's Friday, which means that we're going to have a lively edition of Trash Talk. That's coming up. And our Real Talk Roundtable. That's a tradition here on Fridays on the show. We're going to talk sports and geopolitics. Of course, Alex Ovechkin, the Russian superstar, is getting booed everywhere the Washington Capitals play. There's a WNBA player, whereabouts unknown right now. Sanctions have included Russia being banned from international sporting events and the like. So is this all effective? What message does this send to Russian citizens? And ultimately, how does the world of sports reflect real life? That's going to be our jumping off point with an expert panel. We hope that you'll join us live. If not, make sure you download it later and tell your friends about Real Talk. We're growing this audience every week and we appreciate you being a part of it. We'll talk to you soon. The